Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for that uh, incredibly kind introduction. Um, yeah, I stand here with a certain amount of trepidation looking at the person who's looking down on me, uh, also with a certain degree of surprise because I'm about three and a half weeks into being leader of uh, Britain's largest local authority. Um, I say I'm surprised, not as surprised as my daughter, who was really taken aback by the idea that people would spend a lovely summer's evening listening to her old man uh, <laughs> with her on. So, uh, but I'm absolutely uh, delighted and honoured uh, to be here this evening to give the Chamberlain Lecture. And as a proud born and bred Brummie, I'm delighted that this prestigious annual event is this year absolutely on home soil. As we gather in this amazing historic house, built as we've heard almost 150 years ago for the legendary Joseph Chamberlain. The man who cleared Birmingham slums and earned this city a reputation for being a model of civic government. Now I struggle really to think of another British political leader who is as intimately and closely associated with a place, with, with a city, as Joseph Chamberlain was and, is, and indeed is with Birmingham. And equally, I think it's also difficult to think of a British city whose politics and identity continues to honour the name and bear the imprint of a leader who passed away over a century ago and actually ceased to hold the formal office of civic leader of that place some 40 years prior to his decease. Chamberlain, who uh, lived here from 1880 up until his death in 1914, was a social pioneer with innovative schemes for education, for housing, for the municipal ownership of gas and water. He was a visionary, he was a radical, and as his biographer Peter Marsh stated, in his three years as mayor, just three years as mayor, Chamberlain constructed arguably his greatest and most enduring accomplishment, a model of gas and water or municipal socialism that was widely admired in the industrial world. Marsh goes on, at his ceaseless urging, Birmingham embarked on an improvement scheme to tear down its central slums and replace them with healthy housing and commercial thoroughfares, both to ventilate the town and attract business. So that means Joseph Chamberlain was levelling up long before that phrase ever entered the local government lexicon. And he led the way for towns and cities across the UK and further afield. Chamberlain was, as Winston Churchill famously said, the man who made the weather. And under his guidance, Birmingham was known as the best governed city in the industrial world. Now, equally, I know, of course, that, that, that Chamberlain is in many respects also a divisive figure, and indeed I was touching on that in, in conversations with, with, with some of you before uh, this evening's lecture began. And I think in a city as diverse as 21st century Birmingham is, it would be wrong for me not to reflect that many of his actions on the national and international stage, in particular the period when he was colonial secretary, are somewhat indefensible. That aspect of his life and career uh, would take up an entirely different lecture. But this evening, I want to focus on the man who left a lasting mark on Birmingham and on local government in general. I also want to consider Joseph Chamberlain's radicalism, the scale of his ambition, and to attempt, at least in some way, to predict how a man who was so committed to change and to public service would operate here in 2023. What might his 21st, century's prior 21st century priorities be? Would he be constrained by over-centralised bureaucracy? Could he still have the same impact 150 years after he revolutionised the sector? In my short time as uh, leader of Birmingham City Council, I only took on the role at the, the end of May, this is actually the second time I, I've got to speak here in, in Highbury Hall since taking on that mantle, it does absolutely feel that the great man is kind of looking over my shoulder, I mean, in both directions, really. And I suspect I'm not the first uh, leader of Birmingham uh, to experience that feeling. Because whilst Joseph Chamberlain, the man, may have long departed this life, his works and his deeds remain deeply embedded in Birmingham's collective memory. Now, I must uh, confess that I was a callow uh, 16, 17 year old studying A level history at Great Bar Comp before I actually realised that Chamberlain Square in the city centre was named after Joseph Chamberlain. 
it, you might call that a lack of curiosity, if you will. I mean, in truth, I was obsessed rather more at that point by the Smiths, by Joy Division and The Clash. Uh, so, you know, municipal history wasn't uppermost in my thoughts at that time. And that, so that thought about Chamberlain and the Square simply hadn't occurred to me. Now, if I fast forward 30-something years, and let me say I'm still obsessed by the Smiths, the Joy Division and the Clash, my office in the, the council house actually overlooks that square. And I get a daily reminder when I get to look out the window of Joseph Chamberlain's uh, lasting legacy. Can I also just assure my fellow Brummies that I have no plans thus far to change it to Joe Strummer Place. <laughs> Joseph Chamberlain's achievements in local government really have stood the, the test of time. Those of us who are either actively engaged in, or who comment upon, or simply take an interest in the issues of civic leadership and of civic life in Birmingham, still talk openly of the Chamberlain tradition. His approach, which I think was a really potent mix of bold leadership, of a clear vision of where he wanted the city to be, and a willingness to challenge the status quo in order to get to where he wanted to be, that still absolutely sets the bar for what we expect of Birmingham leaders to this day. I've been around a little while in Birmingham politics, and I have to say that all of Joe's successors, whatever their political stripe, have sought to emulate in some way that approach to leadership that ensured that Birmingham became, to use that famous phrase, the best governed city in the world. And I'm thinking from my, my own experience of people like a particular Labour legend in this city, Dick Knowles, who led the council during the 80s and 90s. I was fortunate enough to serve alongside Dick when I first joined the, the, the council in the late 1990s. And also the work that he did alongside his then conservative sparring uh, partner, Neville Bosworth. And Dick and Neville, in their attempt to match their famous predecessors' impact, they set aside party politics on many issues and worked together to lift Birmingham out of its failing industrial past through major developments, such as the International Convention Centre, such as Symphony Hall and the National Exhibition Centre. Joseph Chamberlain's impact on modern Birmingham isn't therefore just confined to the name of a public square or a portrait on the wall of the council house or indeed the one I'm looking at over there. Joseph remains a powerful influence upon our collective thinking. His approach, his style, his achievements continue to shape how we view the role of leadership and our expectation of what our leaders should do. Now, of course, Chamberlain's achievements transcend Birmingham. And this event is named in his honour because colleagues right across local government continue to take inspiration from a man and a legacy who showed what could be achieved by strong, visionary and bold leadership. Now, I'm firmly of the opinion that uh, leadership is defined by the challenges it faces. And as a civic leader, Joseph Chamberlain faced plenty in his time. His drive to regenerate the city centre was opposed by what was the so-called economist faction on the council. And they also fought his drive to municipalise the utilities. His passionate advocacy of educational reform, which sprang in part from his strong sense of faith, also stirred more than a few tough political battles. But just as Chamberlain's leadership was chested by the challenges of his time, then the big questions facing not just Birmingham, but the whole of local government in 2023, they throw down a very similar gauntlet to us. And I think each of us, whether we're political or spiritual, whether we're commercial or community leaders, have to rise in the same way to the challenges of our own time. So as I sat down to write this lecture, I, I asked myself, what would Joseph Chamberlain think of the challenges and the opportunities facing local government in the 21st century? Given that the UK now is far more centralised than it was 150 years ago, would that great radical still be able to make his mark? And, and what would he actually focus on now? In the main, I think that Joseph Chamberlain's priorities in 2023 wouldn't be too dissimilar to his priorities back in 1873. I expect he'd still focus on health on education and on housing. He would look to have a positive influence on the lives of people 
throughout this city. And as people across the local government sector do every single day, he would seek to narrow the gaps and provide support to our most vulnerable citizens. But in doing that, I think he would also face something of a real reality check. And the man who could forcibly purchase gas and water companies might be somewhat frustrated by the fact that councils in 2023 can't even use right to buy receipts to build more social housing. As we all know, uh, the UK continues to be one of the most centralised countries in the developed world. And, and more must be done to improve local areas' ability to raise the vital funding that we need, to increase the productivity of our economies and improve people's health and well-being. Yes, the devolution deals the, for Greater Manchester and the West Midlands that were announced by the Chancellor of the Exchequer in March of this year were certainly a step in the right direction. Although I'm still to be convinced that the, the Midlands deal deserved quite the big T trailblazer tag uh, that it received. But after years of making the case for greater devolved powers and spending, it's fair to say that the local government sector remains sceptical that the penny has really finally dropped. And frankly, if we do sound a bit like a broken record in places here in Birmingham or up in Manchester or in Bristol or in Leeds, it's because the powerful arguments, the compelling arguments for devolution have largely fallen on deaf ears for far too long. As the Local Government Association, the Core Cities UK, London Councils and Key Cities made clear in a letter to the Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, uh, Michael Gove, earlier this year, cities can level up the country, they can grow an economy fit for the future and tackle the climate crisis. That's only if they have the right resources and the, the extra powers they need. Now, I expect I'm preaching somewhat to the converted uh, in this room this evening, but to truly emulate Joseph Chamberlain, to truly transform our city's economies, areas need investment, and that includes a sustainable and a long-term system for local government finance. We should be empowered to fairly keep the proceeds of local growth that we can then reinvest according to our local needs. And the, the letter that we, we sent to the Secretary of State stated, we need a reset in the relationship between national and local government so local leaders can deliver the changes needed to truly level up their areas, working effectively with the private and public sector partners to draw in that vital investment. We need a shift away from the current system of costly competitive bidding, including the, the system of bidding for levelling up funding. We think urban areas should be given the ability to plan and to commission and to oversee a properly joined up employment and skills service. And I've no doubt that uh, Joseph Chamberlain, frustrated by the 21st century constraints around local government, would also have signed up uh, to such a letter. And he would surely also have backed calls for a wider fiscal devolution to restore local control over the council tax and the rates and reform them to make them fairer. I mean, just imagine for a moment what we could do if we were given the power to raise and retain other taxes, such as tourist tax or proportions of VAT, vehicle excise duty and stamp duty. Taking a leaf out of Chamberlain's book, there's a compelling argument for councils to be given powers to own and run companies to provide chargeable services. 150 years ago, for Chamberlain, that meant gas and water supply. But the modern day equivalent might be digital or information services, both of which I think are as essential to inclusion and meaningful participation in modern life as those services that Chamberlain brought into municipal ownership over 150 years ago. A founding member of the Birmingham Education League in 1867, Chamberlain stated that it is as much the duty of the state to see that children are educated as it is to see that they are fed. So he would surely favour councils being given the freedom to create a seamless path for children and young people from early years to post-16 careers and skills training and then to work with our universities to link them into the local economy to create jobs and innovation to keep more of our graduates here in this city. If we were then to throw in stronger regulatory powers and the retention of right to buy receipts or dare I even suggest the suspension of right to buy in certain areas that would enable us to retain and regenerate the social housing stock, and local government would once again be a force to really be reckoned with. None of this is a power grab. 
It's simply a long overdue redressing of the balance, ensuring that councils or regional partners can make even greater social and economic contributions. The risk of being cliched, which is a trick that politicians sometimes fall into, but I genuinely did get into politics because I wanted to make a difference and to improve the lot of my fellow citizens. That was the case, I think, in Chamberlain's day, and it's the almost universal answer that you'll get from 21st century councillors right across the, the party political spectrum. And there's nothing new, of course, about calls for greater devolved powers. It was the big ask from local government when I was first elected, way back in 1999. And after a great many false dawns in the intervening years, it continues to be an issue that unites councils of all sizes and all political persuasions. We know that we could do so much more, but while we do not have the powers and freedoms that were afforded Joseph Chamberlain and his contemporaries, everyone in this room knows that there is no lack of ambition or lack of vision across the local government sector. Now I know that for some, the local government sector can be a stepping stone, a marker on the way to careers in Whitehall or in the private sector. And I don't decry that for a moment. But I also know that the ambitions for many more begin and indeed end on the local stage. That doesn't and never should be interpreted as a lack of ambition. It's quite simply a commitment to the places where we live, where we work and where we raise our kids. There may be frustrations, but we know we can make a mark. And councils up and down the country prove this during the COVID pandemic, that this amazing sector should never be underestimated. During that period, we maintained vital services. We kept businesses afloat and we proved indispensable when it came to that rollout of testing and vaccination. It was a grim and difficult period for everybody and there weren't many positives, I think, when we look back on the period of the pandemic. But I genuinely believe that the perception of local government changed for the better during that time. And it's testament to the dedication, the expertise, and the sheer hard work of thousands of elected councillors and council staff who, even as they were facing their own personal pressures and tragedies, stepped up to do what this amazing sector does best. And now, as our residents struggle to make ends meet during this cost of living crisis, again, it's councils and their partners who've stepped up, establishing the warm welcome spaces, helping people secure unclaimed benefits, keeping those food banks going at times of spiralling demand. I'd rather that that essential work wasn't necessary, but when families are struggling to heat their homes, pay the soaring bills, and worst of all, to feed their children, all of which is happening in this city right now, this sector has done what it's done best. Here in Birmingham, uh, we declared a cost of living emergency uh, in September. And through that, we've already worked with a range of faith, voluntary and community sector organisations and built a network of 200 warm welcome spaces in every corner of Birmingham. We help people access information, advice and guidance to help them claim the right benefits and money advice, an absolute vital lifeline for so many of them. We've got the information, the guidance out there on energy schemes available for residents to uh, reduce their energy bills. And we put resource into supporting our food banks, our food clubs, the food pantries, the social supermarkets, the community cafes. And we've done all this because, like our council colleagues up and down the country, we want the very best for our citizens. And even when we continue to call out centralisation and complain rightly about the constraints on our ability to act, we've also grown quite adept, I think, at working within and overcoming the limitations placed around us. So here in Birmingham, for example, we launched our Future City Framework. It's an ambitious plan that has been labelled the most important strategy in Birmingham in over a century. And again, I'm conscious of the person who's watching me while I make that claim. But this plan is a route map to a fairer, greener Birmingham of more jobs, better transport options, and higher quality, energy efficient new homes. And I do like to think that Joseph Chamberlain would have applauded the Our Future City framework because it will tackle many of the big challenges that sadly continue to hold too many people across Birmingham back, giving more people in our communities and neighbourhoods a meaningful stake in our city's success. This plan 
which I was very pleased to actually uh, launch as part of its tour around the country from the, the, the terrace of this building uh, a week or so ago, which I was then told had been laid out so Joseph Chamberlain could address his faithful uh, supporters. That was my second full day in the job, so, you know, that thing about the hand of history resting heavy on your shoulder, it really uh, spoke to me. But the, the Our Future City framework has the potential to create 74,000 new jobs. Now, that's an 80% increase on Birmingham City Centre's current employment capacity. It will create up to 35,000 new homes, much needed for our young and growing population. And also, by creating vibrant new neighbourhoods, we will double our population density, and that will bring Birmingham into line with the other major European cities. But all of this, crucially, uh, won't be done at the expense of green open space, because an ever more successful Birmingham will also be a greener city. It'll be a city of active travel, a city of energy efficient homes. Our future city in Birmingham will be a city that meets our challenging route to zero aspirations head on. So to give you a sense of what that means, the plan will double our green spaces here in Birmingham to a level that's comparable with Vienna. It will double our active travel routes to 200 kilometers. That's the same level of healthy transport infrastructure you find in Copenhagen. And these comparisons, I think, really do matter. We're a global city. But in the future, we want cities to aspire to be Birmingham. And this framework outlines how we are going to become a benchmark for how modern cities meet the challenges of the 21st century and beyond. The other thing that's really important to me is that I want Birmingham to be a city that works for all of its citizens. It has to be a city of inclusive growth. And the success of that city has to stretch right beyond the city centre. In short, it needs to be a city of genuine, life-changing levelling up. The potential prize, if we seize this, is enormous. If we level up Birmingham so that economic activity, so that unemployment and skills reach the national average, that would add an estimated £9 billion to the city's economy and put 75,000 people back into work. A pretty staggering numbers, but absolutely essential when you consider the challenges that we face around poverty and structural unemployment. This really is, I think, era-defining stuff. And as I told an audience of MPs, developers and other stakeholders in Westminster last week, if the government is really serious about levelling up for the people and communities of this city, then our future city is really are the plans that they need to back. The response to the, the Ask Future City framework has been extremely positive, and I think with really good reason, because it has the potential to do for the 21st century Birmingham what Chamberlain's municipal socialism did for Birmingham a century and a half ago. You may have seen, if you've looked on, uh, on the website that supports the, the plan, there's lots of really exciting artist impressions of how Birmingham might look in 20 years' time. And they certainly look very different from the, the car-dominated, concrete-bound city, the one that was riddled with those gloomy underpasses that some of you may remember that were a feature of, of my youth. But, of course, towns and cities are about people and not just about cars or even shiny new buildings. And our ultimate success is not going to be judged by the ever-changing skyline of Birmingham. What we will rightly be judged by are the number of lives that we transform and improve by the actions that we take. The vision is great and vitally important, but it only takes you so far. It's the delivery that really matters. And here again, we can turn to Joe, can't we? Chamberlain slum clearances saw the death rate in Birmingham's Corporation Street decrease dramatically from approximately 53 per 1,000 between 1873 and 1875 to 21 per thousand between 1879 and 1881. Pretty dramatic change. And I think our challenge now is to make a similar impact on the big challenges that hold far too many Brummies back right across this city here in 2023. Before I found myself in this role about three and a half weeks ago, uh, my previous cabinet portfolio dealt with the uh, inequalities that are rife right across this city. Frankly, these are inequalities that have remained stubbornly entrenched in too many places for far too long. Some of this is really quite striking. 
This is also a city where unemployment is double the national average. There's a 10 year gap in life expectancy between the poorest and the most affluent areas of Birmingham. And the one that never fails to shock me and I think stands as a, a real uh, uh, challenge to us all. Over 40% of Birmingham's children are growing up in relative poverty. Just last week, there was a report from the End Child Poverty Coalition and it found that the 20, of the 20 parliamentary constituencies with the highest rates of child poverty, five of them are in Birmingham. Four of those five have child poverty rates of over 50%. That is the challenge that we have to face up to. And I think that statistic is even more depressing in a way because by so many other measures, this city of ours is a city that's on the up. We've seen record levels of investment in recent years and the city has truly been transformed. We had last summer an absolutely spectacular Commonwealth Games and that supercharged that transformation with investors and developers queuing up to be part of Birmingham's story. And our future city framework will harness that desire on their part to invest and work in Birmingham, taking the city onto the next level. But what I'm absolutely determined that we have to do is translate that success for Birmingham into genuine, life-enhancing success for the people and communities in every corner of the city. I don't just want to talk about the city centre. The stubborn inequalities that I'm talking about stand in absolutely stark contrast to the success that you see in that transformed and thriving city centre of Birmingham. And again, much as it was in Joseph Chamberlain's time, Birmingham's story in 2023 is a tale of two cities. There's one city that, it's a booming city centre. You've got cranes dotting the skyline. You've got investment coming in. Lots of great cultural and artistic things happening on the streets. But that stands in really stark contrast to the painfully disadvantaged neighbourhoods with high levels of poverty and unemployment that are literally just a stone's throw away from that incredibly vibrant scene. So the AS Future City framework is designed to ensure that the benefits of development and regeneration reach out to those neighbourhoods, reach out to those people uh, and start to transform opportunities. The, the city centre will always be the powerhouse, uh, the beating heart, if you like, for the city and the wider, wider region. But the framework taps into the potential of the communities outside the Birmingham Ring Road and that will mean better jobs, better homes and a greener environment for more of our neighbourhoods. Now I'm a Perry Bar boy, uh, I grew up in a community right in the northern edge of the city and I've always represented communities on the, the, the periphery of the city. I was historically a councillor for, uh, for the Oscar Ward, which is where I went to school and I now represent Glebe Farm and Tilecross, which is about as far east as you can go without leaving Birmingham uh, altogether. So the interests of those communities have always been very central uh, to my personal story and to my political life. And I know that, that parents in these communities are no less ambitious for their kids and residents in these communities are just as deserving in a, of a stake in Birmingham's wider success. So for growth to be truly inclusive and transformational, we're going to build on the ongoing success story in Perry Bar, where thanks to the Commonwealth Games, we leveraged in a massive £700 million for new homes, for transport infrastructure, for public realm and other facilities. And the Future City Framework now seeks to emulate that regeneration of Perry Bar with growth zones in areas like Aston, like Neachels, like Bordesley and Newtown and many others besides, aiming to tackle those long-standing inequalities and giving more people and communities a genuine stake in the success of this city. And through the ongoing community wealth building work that we've been doing with our Birmingham Anchor Network, bringing together some of the big anchor institutions in this city, the council, universities, housing providers, what we want to aim to do is ensure that the strengths of a growing economy reach every corner of our city and that the wealth that is generated is retained within our communities. So we've been using our procurement to support local employment. We're driving social value through the, the anchor network and our Council's Business Charter for Social Responsibility. So we're embedding social value and maximising the benefits of that social value in our major projects. And as I said earlier, success for Birmingham means success for the people and the communities of Birmingham. 
If I think back to Joseph Chamberlain again, I won't for one second pretend that his Birmingham was some kind of utopia of inclusive growth. We are, after all, talking about the Victorian age. But it certainly was a city where life improved for a great many citizens. His city was a city where housing improved, where education standards climbed, and public health outcomes undoubtedly moved in the right direction. And that, after all, isn't it, is what local government is all about. It's what gets us all out of bed every morning. It's what helps us to withstand the frustrations, the constraints, the setbacks. That desire to improve outcomes for our citizens must continue to be the golden thread that runs through everything we do. Because frankly, if we continue to tolerate, even tacitly, a situation in which substantial numbers of our fellow citizens are held back, we aren't just offending our moral sensibilities, we're also sabotaging our future economic and social vitality. And how do we make this change? As I've already stated this evening, our civic institutions are not the independent bodies of Joseph Chamberlain's day. 80 years or more of increasing centralisation by Whitehall have put pay to the days when we could act and be called a city-state. Our budgets are showing the strain of over a decade now of damaging austerity. In the eight years from 2012, councils lost 60p out of every pound that the government had provided to spend on local services. And as I've often said to people when we've had budget discussions, you don't simply close a gap like that by buying fewer paper clips or cheaper toilet roll. So it's hardly surprising that a study last year by the Institute for Government think tank found that local government in England has been hollowed out since 2010. And in addition, many of the levers that would enable us to affect those big economic questions sit in ministerial rather than civic hands. Nevertheless, I'm by nature a glass half full kind of guy, and I still believe that there are real grounds for optimism. Firstly, the terms of the debate are changing. They might be changing slowly, but they are changing. There is this increasing acceptance across the political divide of the need for more local control. The role of the big cities as drivers of the regional economy, the role of councils as the only body able to give that accountable democratic leadership is now more widely acknowledged. So slowly, but I hope surely, the door to greater local power is being edged open. And I think I can also hear the voice of Joseph Chamberlain urging us to get our feet and our shoulders and our elbows firmly into that gap that's opening up. My second ground for optimism lies with what I've found in neighbourhoods and communities right across this city. From those grappling with the most visible and challenging effects of poverty, to those who are far more fortunate. Right across this city, we've got people, we've got organisations, we've got active citizens who want to make change happen. And that's, whether that's from the faith organisations who are running the food banks, to the community groups who are helping people find work. We've got amazing citizens doing fantastic, innovative things that raise hope, that create new opportunities, and open doors that have been closed for far too long uh, for many of our fellow citizens. That's my experience of the place I'm proud to call home. But I have no doubt that colleagues from towns and cities right across the UK could point to similar grounds for optimism. What we must do now is create the environment in which these initiatives can continue to flourish. We've got to ensure that the good practice is shared, the innovation is encouraged, and that local people are themselves empowered to take a lead. That isn't just a responsibility of local government. It's a responsibility for all of us. We need a genuinely collaborative approach, a common endeavour across all partners and across communities to tackle inequality and improve life chances. And if we were looking for a mission statement, a succinct set of words to set out our aims, then perhaps I could suggest the following. We have to account for and grapple with the mass of misery and destitution in our midst, coexistent as it is with the evidence of abundant wealth and teeming prosperity. It is a problem 
which some men would put aside by reference to the eternal laws of supply and demand, to the necessity of freedom of contract, and to the sanctity of every private right of property. Our object is the elevation of the poor, of the masses of the people, a levelling up of them by which we shall do something to remove the excessive inequality in social life. And not my words. Joseph Chamberlain spoke those words in 1885. And in many ways, they are my mantra here almost 140 years later. Because sadly, we still see misery and destitution alongside abundant wealth and teeming prosperity. And ours is still a tale of two cities. So we have a choice. We accept that some things will never change. Or we take a leaf out of Chamberlain's book and we redouble our efforts to tackle inequalities. I put it to you that that's not really a choice at all, is it? So my mission is to ensure that our future city is a city of inclusive growth and opportunity for all citizens in every single corner of Birmingham. In short, a Birmingham of which the man who lived in this house would have been proud. Thank you very much.